In today's episode, I talk about useless ink swabs, designing my own Tomoe River notebook, and where I disagree with the fountain pen community. Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 165 of Goulet Q&A. Um, it's going to be an interesting one for me here today. I think this one is going to be just fine, but I'm actually going to be on vacation next week. Um, I'm actually taking a family vacation, so that's kind of nice. Uh, I'm going to Disney World with the kids um, and Rachel and my parents. But anyway, so we are uh, going to be off. Uh, the rest of the team will be rocking and rolling here, but I didn't want to skip a Q&A, so I'm actually doubling up. I'm shooting two of them back to back today. So the first one I think will be fine for this week, and then next week will probably get a little loopy. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, I've never tried shooting two literally back to back before, but we'll see how it goes. I care that much about you guys. I don't want you to be without a Q&A. Um, anyway, so for this week, anyway, um, just finished Easter, Holy Week. Um, you know, Rachel and I are Catholic, so we like to just really go to church a lot. And so we had like, and we're in the choir too, so it was like five church services in eight days. So we're a little tired after all of that. Um, but it was really good. Good time with the family, good time with the kids and stuff like that. Um, we're prepping for our vacation, so it's just, this has been a really crunched week for us. Um, but still good, still having a good time, rocking and rolling. Um, Business-wise, we restocked a lot of random products. We got some Pilot Custom 823s, some VP Rod and, uh, Rod and Galaxies and stuff like that. Um, just stuff is starting to trickle in that we've been out of for a lot of like March and April and stuff like that. I think a lot of a lot of our manufacturers are restocking after they kind of were depleted from the holidays. I know that seems crazy because it's April, but that's the truth. Um, so that's really good. So I think you'll start to see just random things that we've been out of for a while coming back in. So that's kind of cool. Um, new stuff that we've got in, um, Monograppa inks. We actually used to carry Monograppa inks a while ago and we discontinued them, but they're revamping them a little bit, slightly larger bottle, um, and the colors are pretty cool. So we're, we got those back, so that's kind of cool. Um, and also we're bringing back the Lamy Dialogue 3 by popular demand. Um, we discontinued it several years ago, but we've had a lot of people asking us to carry it. Um, we're gonna dip our toes in the water with it just with the matte black one. Um, they technically have four different colors. They've got a silver one, like, like a palladium colored one. They've got a piano black and a piano white as well. So we're gonna start with the matte black because I think that's gonna be the most popular. And then uh, maybe the silver after that and we'll see how it goes. But um, if, that, if you, that is of interest to you, we should have that in the next week or so. Um, we've got them on order. We're just waiting for them to come back in. Um, and uh, so that'll be cool. I actually don't have a Lamy Dialogue 3. That's like one of the only Lamy's that are available in the US that I don't have in my personal collection. So I'll probably snag one of those. Um, and then, uh, of course, I'll be doubling up the q and I already mentioned that, but uh, I had it in my notes, so I just said it. But anyway, so I'm gonna be shooting slightly shorter Q&A uh, today, I think. I always say that at the beginning, but then you're looking at the timestamp of when it's already published before I even know how long it's gonna be. So I should just not mention anything like that anymore, should I? Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do five questions today. So let's start out with some pen and writing questions, shall we, after I take a sip of water. Hmm. Okay, this is from Evan M on Facebook. So I just got my new Aurora 88 Flex. My question is, is there a break-in period or anything with it? Because my Dream Touch and M1000 Flex nibs flex way more than this one. It's not disappointing or anything. It goes from double extra fine to broad, but I expect more from a vintage flex. P.S. Best company ever. <laughs> I don't know if you're talking about Aurora or if you're talking about us. Or if you're talking about Visconti or Pelican, I don't know. You mentioned a bunch of different companies, but I'm going to take it as you're talking about me because that's the compliment that I would like to take right now. Um, so yes, so I think it's important to talk about the difference, at least my interpretation of the difference between flex and softness. I think those are two different things. Flex, I'm literally talking about the amount of line variation, how much the nib tines bend and separate to give you that line width variation as you're applying pressure to the pen. That to me is flex. Softness is really how springy the nib is, like how much the nib tines can bend but not necessarily separate. So when you're talking about Visconti and the Pelican M1000, those are very soft. So they feel very, very springy. However, if you try to actually flex them out to the width that you can with the Aurora 88 Flex, 
you're gonna spring those nibs and they're not going to be able to perform well for very long. So that's really the issue here. Um, I actually, a couple of months ago when they were first coming out with these flex nibs, um, we had the Nimmeister who designed these flex nibs actually in the US and I got a chance to meet him. Um, and he explained to me through a translator because he does not speak English, um, the design that they came up with for the 88 flex. Um, and it was very intentional to have the softness that it has. And what they were explaining to me is that they tried some that were not as soft. They tried some that were even softer than this. They can make them softer, but the problem is they're going to spring easier. And I definitely witnessed this for myself um, with the uh, Omos uh, extra flexible nibs. Those are some of the softest flex nibs that I've ever used um, and are really quite amazing. However, people sprung those all the time. I sprung it the first time that I used it. Stephen Brown did a video and he sprung it. It's very easy to do, no matter what your experience is. So that's the challenge that you run into. You can get softer things, but if you're trying to actually flex and really get some line variation on those really, really soft nibs, the chances are you're gonna spring it. So yes, this is a more vintage inspired design. They actually kind of designed this after flex nibs that they came up with in the 70s that were not popular, so they stopped making them. Um, but this is more kind of going back to that way. Um, but it is designed for a balance between softness and line variation with longevity in mind of being able to flex it and use it consistently for a long time. So that's why they settled on where they are with these nibs. I personally, really like it. I don't feel that it's like hard to flex it. You know, it's definitely easier than say like a Noodler's steel flex nib, which is hard to compare because of the price difference between those two. But um, quite honestly, I'm not, I'm not disappointed with the Aurora flex. I know some people out there, especially when you hear about vintage flex and it's a limited pen and the price is up there in the 500s, you know, it can, it can get a lot of expectations up there that this thing should really just blow your mind. Well, it's still bound by the laws of physics and stuff like that. And yes, there are vintage flex nibs, true vintage ones that that can be softer and things like that. I don't have as much experience with those like wet noodle type soft nibs, but they're not super common. So they're, there's not that a lot of them out there. And I think honestly, um, there is a break in period with these. And I think that over time, a nib like this that you're flexing more, it will will get a little bit softer. It's not like it's gonna happen in two weeks or anything like that, but over time, yeah, it is going to get a bit softer. So if you are okay with where it's at right now, it's only going to get softer. It's not gonna firm up over time. So I think you're gonna find a good kind of healthy balance there. Um, so I've already talked a little about the Aeroflex and I'm not gonna give a demonstration or anything like that here, but um, that's kind of my thoughts on it for right now. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, this, this one is the blue one. This came and went. Um, they're coming out with the red one very soon and then they're gonna have some other colors. I don't know the order of the colors that are gonna come out from here on out, but I believe it's six or eight colors, something like that. So they're still gonna be super limited though, only 188 of each color worldwide. So it's gonna be just really hard to get your hands on them anyway, but I thought it was worth mentioning because any new flex nib that's coming out is worth talking about. All right, this question is from Zidia on Instagram. I've always wondered what exactly a converter converts. Why is it called a converter? What does it convert and into what? A boring cartridge pen into an exciting breadth of ink possibilities? I love your language here. That's my best guess, can you help? Uh, well, Zidia, you pretty much answered your own question. That is literally what it's converting. Um, to show you a visual example, and I know this is, if you're, if you're a very experienced fountain pen person, this, um, you probably know the answer to this question, so you can skip ahead if you want to. But, um, you know, I always like to take questions like this because, you know, we get a lot of newer folks on here. Um, I do cover this in Fountain Pen 101. Um, I have a video series called Fountain Pen 101 that you should definitely check out if you're newer to fountain pens. I got a whole thing in there about uh, filling mechanisms. Um, but uh, using this Lamy Safari Petrol as an example, um, it is a cartridge converter pen. The challenge with these cartridge pens, you know, they're very convenient. Yes, you can just pop a cartridge in, use it, whatever. Um, the challenge is most of them are proprietary. Um, some of them use what's called a standard international, which means a several different brands that also standardized on that standard international cartridge size um, can make them. So, you know, Dimene, Private Reserve, Monograppa, you know, Mont Blanc, a lot of them use this standard international um, cartridge. So you can use some brand variation there, but I've, I chose the Lamy specifically because they have unique cartridges that only fit Lamy. So they have seven, eight, nine colors total. 
So the challenge is, unless you're using an ink syringe and you're refilling your cartridges with whatever, whatever other ink, you have to use their cartridges. So they have this thing called a converter. And the converter, literally what it does is it takes your cartridge-only pen and converts it so that you can fill from any other ink that you want. So that's what it's converting. It's converting the filling mechanism from cartridge to, a, in this case, a piston, because um, it is a piston screw type converter. Make sense? So typically this will be called a cartridge converter, and the pen will be called a cartridge slash converter pen, because it will accept either one. Um, and so the, literally that's what it's converting, is the filling mechanism type. Now it's not the only type of conversion that can be done. Um, if you think about pens, the Lamy won't do it because it's got this big gaping hole in the middle of it. But if I'd, you know, maybe thought about it ahead of time, I could have chosen a different pen. Ah, here we go. I have an Edison Collier here. So um, I just shot a video on this and they'll be coming out in the next couple weeks. But um, this is a pen that is a cartridge converter. So it has uh, a cartridge that it accepts. It has a converter as well. But you can also put silicone grease on the threads and you can do what's called an eyedropper conversion, which is where you fill the entire body of the pen with ink if it's all sealed up. And then you can have, in this case, over four milliliters of ink that slosh around in the pen, and that is another type of conversion. So it's the changing of the filling mechanism type that calls it a converter. It's just for a slang term for the ease of things because the most common type of conversion is using this you know, screw piston type converter into a cartridge filling pen. But the thing is, it's really interesting is like most of the customers that I end up interacting with, most people who uh, kind of come into our world, they literally have like a conversion from ballpoints or gel or rollerball, whatever, into fountain pens. And the biggest part of the appeal is not so much the ease and convenience of swapping out a cartridge, it's the breadth of different ink possibilities that you can have, as you mentioned, I love your, your verbiage you had there. Um, so literally there's a conversion in that way. So the bottled ink is the most appealing thing. So for us, for example, the Lamy you know, pens don't come with an included converter, but like the Lamy Z24 converter is one of, if not the top selling product that we have, depending on, you know, timing and stuff like that. But it's, you know, everybody pretty much that wants to buy a Lamy pen. And I pass this feedback up to Lamy and they do things the way they do them. But, um, you know, I pass that feedback up that it's like, if you are buying a fountain pen, you're probably going to want a converter, you know, just because um, that's, that's the vast majority of people, at least that I interact with. Um, are using it in that style, not necessarily using it for cartridges. Some people like the cartridges, but not as much versatility. So it is doing the versatility, and that's where it's coming from. Cool. Got an ink question for you. This is from MNML Scholar, Minimal Scholar. Ah, I see what you're doing there on Instagram. And uh, Minimal Scholar asks, ink reviews often have huge swatches of the ink smeared or swabbed onto a page. But in my experience, ink rarely looks like that when I write with them. So I tend to focus on the writing samples in the reviews to guesstimate what it might look like in my own pen and on my own paper. What should I be learning about an ink from the giant ink swatches on Goulet pens and reviews? So you're kind of talking about two things right there. So, you know, you're talking about this, this big swab swatch, which you are typically doing with a Q-tip. Um, there's a couple of reasons, and I can say this very much from experience, because um, right now we have, I don't even really keep track literally of to the minute um, how many inks we have, but it's somewhere around 550 um, currently available for sale on our site. But uh, we've, you know, carried and discontinued a variety. We've probably carried 700 to, 7, 7 to 800 different ink swabs over the years um, because of ones that have come and gone. Uh, so that's a, a lot, a lot of ink. And that is way too many to ink up into a pen and do a writing sample for every single ink that comes out. It just, it, it takes a lot of time. Anybody who's done ink reviews, you know it just takes a lot of time. Not so much doing the review itself, but cleaning out the pen and then doing another one. So um, the vast majority of the reason why the ink swabs are so easy to do is because you can just use a Q-tip, dip it in there, swab it, and then you toss the Q-tip, and then you can do another one. So you can sit and do a whole bunch in one sitting. Then you gotta do the scanning and the color adjusting and all that stuff. All that stuff takes en enough time as it is. But um, that's part of the reason is because literally just getting it up on our site logistically is way easier to do a swab. Now, of course, yes, I agree with you that this is not necessarily what it's gonna look like in your pen. 
Um, that's why we always do a, a writing sample, which we use a glass pen, other people dip the pens. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, you could use a, a literally like a calligraphy dip pen. Um, the other thing about these swabs is if you're doing a writing sample, it's a very thin line. If you're looking at a whole website, you know, like our category page on our website, and there's, you know, da, 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 all these different inks, a lot of them look very similar. They just end up looking kind of dark and black and all that, unless it's a very wild color. The writing samples themselves don't really pop quite as much as these do. So at first glance, when you're looking through the page, you're like, I'm looking for a blue. If you're only looking at writing samples, you're like, is it a blue or a purple or a green? I can't really tell. So the swatches help to just narrow it down and get you like, a, hey, here's a general impression of what the color is going to look like. You can tell that this is a Lamy Turquoise-ish color. Is this Lamy Turquoise or Lamy Pacific? You will never know. <laughs> Little inside joke there for those of you that know what I'm talking about. Um, but that helps you to narrow it down and then you can dive in a little deeper and you can look at the reviews and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's part of why we do it that way is because generally when you're shopping, you're like, I want a blue, I can narrow it down and then you can zoom in a little bit. We try to do writing samples. We try to do ink reviews as much as we feasibly can. Um, you know, our customer care team and, and other uh, folks that we have are, are writing notes on, uh, they go in every order that comes out. That's actually what one of these cards is, is one of the cards that we use for our notes. Um, so they'll do writing samples and then they'll do kind of a separate writing sample that then our media team is scanning in and, and putting onto the individual product pages and stuff. It just takes a lot of time and coordination to make that happen. Um, but we try to make that happen as much as possible. If it's doing like a full-on ink review, we do a bunch of those too. Um, I don't even know how many you have at this point, but it's got to be 150 or something like that. It's, it's a good number, um, which is still not nearly uh, as many as the inks that we have, but still, um, we try to do what we can. And there's a lot of different people that do ink reviews different ways. I think, um, you know, it's helpful to show when you're looking at an ink review, yes, a lot of people are using it just for, um, you know, writing you know, that's the, the vast majority of people are when they buy fountain pens, they're using them to write. But there's a lot of people that do other things too. Um, use them for art, use them for calligraphy, you know, different nib types and things like that. If you're using something like this, if you have a pen that's really wet and gushing, um, it gives you an idea of kind of what it might look like more there than as opposed to if you have this little extra fine, this is this tiny little amount of ink. Um, also, there are some people that do swabs and do ink washing and stuff like that. They use it for different art purposes. So it can be helpful for that too. I don't think that's the majority of people using fountain pen ink, but um, it is at least somewhat of an impression there. So um, that I think is pretty much my explanation as to why the swabs are so popular. I know that um, logistically they're probably mm, 15 times easier to do, 15 times faster. So, um, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a lot logistically easier thing to do. But the thing I'll kind of leave you on is, you know, you can you can look at these swabs, you can look at the ink reviews, all this kind of stuff, but the number one thing that's gonna tell you if you like the ink the best is to try it yourself, which is why we have the ink samples, shameless plug, four or five samples in the store, but um, that is why we started doing that. And actually, we started doing, um, we started offering ink samples before we even started doing our own ink swabs. Um, because the ink swabs was a very difficult process. But um, if you look back historically, it was only a couple of months overlap that we did that because we wanted to try to get the swab thing figured out pretty quickly. It was the digital color correction thing that was kicking my butt. Uh, initially trying to figure out how to do that, mainly because I had no photography or color correcting experience whatsoever and I had to learn it from scratch. And then I realized that I was doing it wrong all along and we had to redo all of them like a year down the road. This was early Goulet Pens days. These are the things that you like don't remember or know or care or think about. Um, but they were like the hard knocks of the early days of GPC. Uh, but anyway, so um, had to learn all the swab stuff, but we started offering samples before we even started offering the swabs on the site because that really is the best way for you to know if you're gonna like an ink or not. Because no matter what I try to display, the digital rendering of it is gonna be different because I can't control what your monitor is. And literally, if you study up on color correction, which yes, that is a field to be studied. Um, but if you study up on that, the, the visual digital display cannot display the full range of colors that your eyes can see in real life. It's just physically impossible at this time with the monitors that we have. So um, even with like a retina display, you know, it's still, it just cannot render all of the full color range that you can see in real life. So there's still nothing like seeing it in person, the subtleties and all the stuff that you're gonna see. Lighting conditions vary a lot too. The pen type, the writing pressure, the speed, all these different things impact what the ink actually looks like on the page. So there's nothing like having it in person. All right, got a paper question here. This is from Acostamate on Instagram. 
in Q&A episode 163 at 48 minutes and 33 seconds. Regarding Tomoe River Paper, you mentioned that you would have to design a new notebook format for meetings, etc. Is that something you would seriously consider? A Goulet journal with TRP and A5 dot grid with tons of pages would be awesome. Do you think that is something we could hope for anytime soon? Well, it is something that I would consider, slash have considered, slash am considering. Um, you know, when it comes to paper, let me just, before you get too excited and start drooling all over your keyboard, um, the thing that I'll say about paper that's always been a challenge, not just Tomoe River, but anything. I've talked to Claire Fontaine and Rodia, I've talked to them about doing different notebooks and custom things. The problem, the challenge is a couple of different things. One is quantity, minimum quantities required because in order to get custom notebooks made, you have to sell just a boatload of them, almost literally a boatload. I mean, it's just, it's crazy how many notebooks you have to buy because what happens is they have these machines in order to get the cost down to anything reasonable, they have a lot of setup and a lot of initial kind of imprinting time and stuff like that that has to be done. So they need to do a long run of these notebooks and make a certain number of them to make up for those fixed costs of the setup and design and all that kind of stuff. And if you know businessy, economic-y kind of things, you have a certain amount of fixed costs and then your variable costs. So your fixed costs are very high. Your variable costs are relatively low with paper. So the more of them you can make, the much more cost effective you can get it. The problem with small runs of notebooks and even as, as big and grand as we are here at the Goulet Pen Company, we still are such a small timer when it comes to moving notebooks. Uh, in the quantities that are needed to produce them at a very efficient low rate. You know, I'm not joking, like certain brands that I've talked to, they want runs of 5,000, 10,000 notebooks at a time to have some reasonable things to even like talk about doing custom stuff. So it varies by every manufacturer and all this kind of stuff. And, um, but that's the challenge that we run into is, you know, 5,000 notebooks, that's a lot of freaking notebooks. Like it, it's a lot of notebooks. I mean, a lot of notebooks. So it has to be a very popular size, very much in demand kind of thing. When you're talking about Tomoe River and an A5 with a dot grid, okay, we're starting to get into a very popular kind of place. So it comes be a little a bit more of a conversation. Even still, quantities become an issue. So um, that is one thing that I would either need to be able to sell a lot and have a large volume moving through so that I can get large runs made and sell a continuous flow. And in those cases, either I'm talking to manufacturer, either they're willing to ramp up and let us buy bits at a time, or they make a ton, we have to commit to all of it, and we store and warehouse that stuff and just sell a little bit, 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 and then over time, we make that money back. So it's, it's a big commitment, it is. That's why you don't see a whole lot of custom notebooks out there, unless somebody's buying the paper and like hand stitching them or doing something like that, to get like a really nice bound kind of custom made thing. It's really expensive and usually, frankly, what's happening when they're doing that, until there's like a critical mass that can be hit with selling a certain volume of these notebooks, usually whoever's selling them is taking a huge hit on margin and just barely scraping by, maybe even taking a loss, doing a loss leader trying to get traction with a new notebook because you just run into you know, logistical challenges with that because the costs are so high. Um, so we have, you know, a prototype here, which I almost never like to show you guys prototypes, especially in Q&A because it's more timeless. Usually I save this kind of stuff for like an Instagram story on, on my personal account that'll go away over time. But, um, you know, I have a prototype here that I'll show you just because I really want to gauge interest. So I'm, I'm looking for you deep paper people, which if you sat this far into my answer to this question anyway, you're probably pretty interested in paper. So I have one here, it's a relatively thin cover. I'm not gonna give you any brand name or anything like that, but um, it's a relatively thin cover. This is an A6 size, um, but I, I have uh, a prospect of being able to carry this in an A5. So this one is, is just under a 300 page count. So it's about 150 sheets or so. Um, so the actual functional ones, and it is dot grid paper, it's got a 68 gram Tomoe River paper. Um, it's good stuff. There's not a lot of extra whimsy to it, no numbers, no bookmarkers or anything like that. Um, but in an A5 size, the price would be my biggest concern. Um, so I won't even say what the price is because that is kind of variable and I'm in the, the um, the place where I'm trying to negotiate and figure that out. But I would be curious to know from you all if I had a notebook like this, 
you know, 300 sheet count ish. A5 Tomoe River 68 gram dot grid. What would you be willing to pay for this from my store? That's what I really need to know because I can figure out from our manufacturer what my costs would be. But if I'm way off the mark in terms of what you all are willing to pay, that will sink or swim this whole project. So keep that in mind. I'm really just blatantly, obviously prospecting here and trying to get information from you. But if I get a really good response, I need to know like what's the max you would be willing to pay for this notebook? Not like how much you'd like to pay, like, oh, five bucks sounds great. No, that's unrealistic. So be real with me about how much this would cost. Keeping in mind, you know, a notebook like a Leuchtturm, um, which I have, uh, Rachel, you know, in an A5 size. So imagine this would be in kind of an A5 size. A notebook like this will run you $20 or so. This is the full bullet journal one, this is 25, but a non-bullet journal official one would be 20. So this is kind of what I got to compare to. Now granted, this is not Tomoe River paper, you know, but this is like a 230, 240, 250 page count, a sheet count, page count, page count. Um, so it's, it would be a little thicker than this, Tomoe River paper starting at 20 bucks. It would be more than 20 bucks. I can guarantee you of that. So let me know how much you would be willing to pay and I can keep that conversation rolling. I'm very interested in your feedback. Give me feedback. Okay. Last question I have for this week and then we'll roll on through the weekend here. So this is a personal question, um, which I think is really interesting. It's sort of pen related, but it's also kind of personal. So um, we can kind of cover both with one topic here. This is from Hope F on Facebook. Do you have any opinions or preferences that aren't popular in the fountain pen community? I myself love hearing some feedback while I write and I find something oddly satisfying about a little bit of echo on the page, but I find that not many people agree. Your videos are what got me into fountain pens. Thank you and the Goulet pen team. Well, thank you, Hope. That's really nice of you to say. Um, absolutely, I have things that I disagree with the whole, the full, whole fountain pen community. Um, and I think if there's one thing that I've learned being in the fountain pen community for the last eh, eight years is um, if you ask 10 people what they think about something, you're probably gonna get 10 different opinions about it. Or you may get, you know, five opinions that agree, but it'll be nuanced and they won't necessarily agree on it fully. That's part of the beauty of this whole hobby is it's so personalized and it's so, you can kind of sculpt it and get the experience that you want out of it. Um, but with that is gonna come a lot of different opinions. Now, definitely there are some, some things that people generally kind of agree on. You know, pens that have larger ink capacity are usually a little more popular, but not necessarily, and, and all these kind of things. So we could talk all day about different people's opinions and stuff like that. But um, I definitely have some opinions that I could talk about, which will maybe spark some some curiosity on your part. Um, but, uh, um, you know, all of this is, to me, so interesting because it's, it's completely driven by passion. Everybody who's in this community is here because they want to be, not because they have to be. So we all have our little things and our little quirks that we love. And, you know, it's, it's fun to kind of get in and banter and stand up for the things that we really like. And we kind of band together on, you know, it's funny. Like, we'll have somebody be like, oh, yeah, man, I love this style of pen, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wait, you like fine nibs? Ah, oh, screw fine nibs. You know, and so it's just really interesting um, to see how, like, we can all agree on certain parts, but then a complete, completely opposite about nuanced pieces of it. It's really fascinating. Um, so I'll get into a few uh, that I just kind of thought of off the top of my head uh, last night as I was prepping this. So uh, one of them that I think uh, are kind of interesting, I've talked about this a little bit, but um, I have a collection now of 500 pens or so. I don't have an exact count at the moment, um, but it's a, I have a lot, a lot of different pens. Um, and I will say, based on the style that I tend to use most of my pens, I think uh, my favorite filling mechanism is the cartridge converter. And I know that's a little bit controversial because typically they're cheaper pens, you know, the more expensive and elaborate ones like a Pelican M800 is a piston and has a bigger ink capacity and yada, yada, yada. I change my inks a lot and I like to be versatile. And usually when you get into piston pens, you get into proprietary tools to take them up. They don't make them as easily disassemblable and all this kind of stuff. I'm a tinkerer. I like to swap my nibs. I like to mess around. I change my inks a lot. I actually prefer the cartridge converter pen because it's so easy to maintain. They're generally more affordable so you can buy more pens, you know, I love that. Um, you can use the bulb syringe to clean them out. This is my single favorite tip that I've ever discovered in the fountain pen community so far is using a bulb syringe to clean out a cartridge converter pen um, and just being able to take them apart and play with them and stuff like that. So um, 
you know, I know when questions come up about favorite filling mechanisms, there will be a select few that talk about cartridge converter, and they usually get bashed by people that are, oh, you know, how could you say that? That's the, the Platinum Preppy uses a cartridge converter. Well, I don't know. I like I like them, and I'll defend cartridge converters. Um, so that's one one thing uh, that I'll stand up for. Um, for me, okay, so everybody's got different nib size preferences, of course. Um, but for me, broad nibs um, are, are generally not popular in the community at all. That's why they're just shrinking and going away a lot in a lot of different pen models. Because, And I'm, I have my sales numbers to prove people don't buy broads. Like, they just do not follow through on them. That makes me sad. I wish they... That more people bought them. I think a lot of it has to do with paper quality. We could debate that all day long. That's not the issue. But my contentious kind of thing about broader nibs in general, my handwriting, my personal handwriting, I feel gets better as I go broader on my nibs. And I think it looks worse when I go with finer nibs. And it completely befuddles me. I literally still don't understand other people's viewpoint on that. I've had it explained to me. You'll explain to me in the comments about why that is the case for you. And it still just will not be something that I can understand. The way that it's explained to me is when you have a finer nib, you're able to control it more or something like that. I don't know. I guess I don't really understand. I can't even explain it. But apparently most people, when they use finer nibs, their handwriting looks better to them. Um, I guess when you have a broader nib, the letters can run together or something like that. But I, I tend to write larger most of the time when I write, you know, specifically if I'm using like a dot grid paper or something like that, unless I'm using a really extra fine nib, if I'm using something broader, I'll just double up the lines and just write that thing big, you know, or I'll take two lines, whatever I have to do. A lot of my notes and stuff are a little more freehand and I'll just take up as much space as I need to. So I'm, I'm not afraid to write bigger. I tend to write pretty fast as well. So some about a broader nibs to me just it makes my handwriting look better, especially stubs. Love stubs. Um, when I write, you know, like extra fines and fines, I have to slow down a little bit, and it's just it to me it like I have more like wiggly kind of like you see more of my kind of wiggliness and imperfections, and uh, it just doesn't look as good. So the broader nibs to me kind of like mask and smooth out a lot of my shakiness <laughs> while I'm writing. I don't have like that shaky hands, but just like I, I'm very inconsistent with my letters. Like when I write an, an I'm the worst with like lowercase L's and lowercase T's. I'll I'll do a straight line on an L and I'll loop a T and then cross it and it just it's a mess. You know I'll try to loop my L's and if I'm writing a you know the, a word that has two L's in it, one will be a straight line, the other one will be a loop, and it's just a mess. I can't get it together. So when I have broader nibs, it kind of like masks that and makes everything look a little more similar. So to me, in my handwriting, I think it looks better with broad nibs. Most people think their handwriting looks better with fine nibs. That's a thing. Um, another thing kind of related to handwriting is, um, generally speaking, and I even say this in my own videos, like if you want your handwriting to be better, especially with something like a flex nib or a stub or something like that, slow down your writing and be more intentional about it. That will help most people. That's why I say that in the videos. But me personally, it's the opposite. Um, I, I tend to do a little better. Maybe this has to do with my using broader nibs and stuff like that. Um, but I find that my handwriting tends to be in a sweet spot about like the 70% mark. If you go like as slow as you could possibly stand and as fast as you can handle it, if I'm at about 70% speed, that's kind of my sweet spot in terms of how my handwriting looks best. If I slow down too much, again, I get kind of that inconsistent shaky thing. Maybe that just means I need to practice more. Probably that's the case. But in just in terms of the way that I've been using pens for the last whatever years, um, is uh, that's about my sweet spot in terms of the speed. So uh, I tend to, you know, I tend to be a, a you know, my, my handwriting looks a little better if I try to if I'm if I'm pushing my speed just a little bit, um, and that's not not super common. Um, this is another one, and oh, this one is going to get some of you stirred up a little bit. Maybe not all of you, but some of you will will scoff at me about this, and so I'm I'm putting it out there. Just go ahead, put your comments in. I can take it. I'm a big boy. Um, I, of all people, love fountain pens. And you all know that. Like, this is a, this is a safe place. I can talk here. This is a trusting place. Um, I love fountain pens. You know that. It's my life. It's literally my livelihood. I feed my family because of fountain pens. Literally, because Rachel and I are both in this business, we would not be where we are without fountain pens. Um, that said, as much as I'm in love with them and as deep as I am passionate about them, I do not believe that fountain pens have to be used for everything. 
I know, I know. There are some people out there that like they're complete and total converts. They never want to touch or look at a ballpoint or rollerball the rest of their lives. To me, as much as I love them, they are still a tool. And um, as far as what purpose they're accomplishing, to me, it's enjoyment. And I do not enjoy the experience of writing with a fountain pen on carbon copy paper or writing with a fountain pen on like a photo paper or uh, a, a receipt at a restaurant and it smears everywhere. That to me is trying to make a tool do something that it's not intended to do. So I'm a little more pragmatic in terms of that. And, and along those lines, I also don't believe that everybody in the world should use fountain pens. I know that probably seems a little weird because it's like, I obviously would benefit greatly if a lot more people use fountain pens, but I know that they're not for everyone and for every situation. It's niche, it has its place. I want the people that use them to be super passionate and do it. There's nothing that irks me more related to fountain pens than when I try to introduce people to it and all they do is complain and piss and moan and talk about how it leaks on their fingers and all stuff. And I'm like, that's part of the experience. Like, you gotta love that. And if if somebody is fighting it that hard and it's just, ah, oh, I use this pen and I, I inked it up and it's it's not writing anymore and I go in there and the, the converter's dry <laughs> and there's no ink left in the pen, I'm like, well, you gotta refill the the pen with ink and they're like, ah, this is too much trouble. And I'm like, you should not use fountain pens. Just go back to your ballpoints and just just leave this community because this is not for you. <laughs> you know, if they're, they're, if they're fighting it that hard. So I will never try to like push somebody into it if they're not meant to be. And I've introduced like all my family members and everything to it. And most of them do not use fountain pens on a regular basis because it's just not for everybody. But I like that it keeps this, this community like pure and, and not pure, you know, in like a weird way, but like, you know, it keeps it packed and everybody who's into it is super into it and that to me is just awesome so i know yes financially i could probably benefit more by pushing and pushing and trying to get people into it more but i'm, I'm not into that so um, i maybe am against you know some logic in that way especially like in the personal use and not trying to use it in every situation you know i do carry around a rollerball pen now, i'm still picky about my rollerballs but I do carry around a rollerball to use in certain situations where it makes sense. Um, I'm not big on ballpoints though. I still really hate those. So I try never to use those if I have any choice about it. Um, okay, so this is another one uh, um, that I'll get into. Um, I ink up and carry any and all of my pens, even the ones that cost $1,000 or more. I will ink them up and I'll use it. To me, life is too short to buy a pen keep it in the box, shove it away. And to me, like that's a collector thing and I respect that, but that's not me. Like I would never wanna buy a pen and just stick it away and never pull it out and look at it and play with it and ink it up and all that stuff. So I, all my pens are fair game, you know? I've got a Namiki um, Moonlight uh, Yukari that is $2,800. It's my most expensive pen. And I ink it up and carry it around. And I'll bring it and, you know, show it to people and let them hold it and play with it and stuff like that. And that's, to me, that's like, yeah, man, that's why these things exist. It's functional art. That's that's the beauty of it to me. So to me, I would never buy it and just kind of stick it away. That's Some people do that. And look, I got, I got nothing but respect if that's how you want to do it. Because again, this is a personal lifestyle thing. So more power to you if you want to do that. But for me, I don't do that. I ink up everything, I use it, I carry stuff around, and I really don't sweat it. I've, I'm not a clumsy person, so um, I've never like, I've never lost any meaningful pen. I may have some preppies I've lost track of, but I've never had a meaningful pen that I've lost. Um, I keep track of everything. Um, I've never dropped anything and damaged it significantly. Now I know other people have, and that's fine, but in all my experience, I never have. So I just, I'm not an accident prone person, so I'll just carry them around everywhere and just use them. and. You know, they're just pens. You can replace them if you need to over time. Now, if I lose a $2,800 pen, that'd be pretty sad, but I keep track of those pens pretty well. Um, okay, and then this last one um, is kind of interesting. This is about paper. Um, for me, paper can never be too smooth. Uh, some people like absolutely hate Clairefontaine because it's too smooth. Some people hate Rhodia, they think it's too smooth and they prefer something with a lot more bite. I, I like and appreciate a lot of different kinds of paper. I tend to lean towards the smoother papers, but literally like Clairefontaine Triumph is some of the smoothest paper I've ever used. And even that, I'm not like, I'm not like, ooh, this is getting to be too smooth. I'm like, yeah, this is great. Give it to me smoother, you know? Like I'll take paper as smooth as it can possibly be. Um, you know, if ink would work on photo paper, I'd probably use it on that. You know, it's like, uh, for me, I just, the smoother it is, the better. So I've never had any trifecta of pen, ink, and paper to me that's ever felt 
too smooth, which is funny because I write really fast. I use broad nibs and stuff like that. And I just, to me, I love it. I just love it. Maybe I'm just not as picky about how my handwriting looks, <laughs> but that's kind of where I'm at. So anyway, some fun stuff there. Um, I'm going to roll that into the question of the week for this week. So my question of the week for you is what fountain pen opinions or preferences or whatever do you have that you feel go against the greater pen community? And you can lay it all on the line here and we can have some sweet, healthy debate in the comments. I would love to see that. Um, that'll be the question of the week for this week. So there's your Q&A. Hope you've enjoyed that very much. Um, and uh, I will, uh, I guess, talk to you. I'll, I'll have a video out next week, but I won't be engaging a whole lot on social media and whatnot uh, uh, until the next couple of weeks. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this Q&A. Uh, thanks so much for watching and right on.